to calculate ensemble averages, that is to calculate thermodynamical properties. Uh, and we have seen, and you have seen also a few movies, uh, on how we can calculate uh, uh, reaction barriers and how we can follow in real time uh, chemical kinetics. Uh, the last application of molecular dynamics uh, is slightly more different. Uh, in particular, one can use uh, finite temperature classical molecular dynamics as an optimization scheme. Um, in general, suppose that you have a, a complex potential energy surface. Uh, this is obviously in one dimension, but you could think this as being in a multi-dimensional space. Uh, and actually, your potential energy function could represent uh, a complex cost function. Again, it could be, say, the problem of uh, optimizing uh, the usage of your planes uh, on several routes uh, for an airline company. And obviously, depending on where you put your planes, uh, you have a certain cost. And so this cost function tends to be very complex uh, depending on your coordinates, how you arrange your planes. Uh, and finding uh, either the global <coughs> minimum or sort of one of the lowest minima can be a very complex affair. And uh, one of the powerful techniques that has been introduced uh, uh, in the early 80s uh, is something called uh, simulated annealing. Uh, that is basically uh, a technique uh, that bases itself uh, on a thermodynamical analogy. That is, suppose that you want uh, to find uh, this minimum, uh, and if you were to use a deterministic recipe, it would be very difficult. You would start from a certain point uh, and then go down uh, according to the gradient uh, until you end up uh, in what would be a local minima. And so what, uh, in particular, Kirkpart Kirkpatrick, Gelat, and Beck introduced uh, was a thermodynamical technique uh, in which you really populate uh, your phase space uh, uh, with what we call walkers. Uh. So these are sort of, you know, dynamical systems. Uh, those are the points that represent those dynamical systems. Uh, you give them some coordinates, that is, they are going to have some potential energy, and then you give them some temperature, so they are going to have some kinetic energy. You can think this uh, as a swarm of skiers, uh, sort of going around uh, your phase space. Uh, and if you have a lot of them, and uh, if these have a lot of temperature, uh, they will move uh, all over phase space. Uh, but by the time you start sort of very slowly cooling uh, these dynamical systems down, uh, you start removing temperature for them, uh, they are going to condensate, really, in uh, whichever local minima they find. Uh, so, you know, some of them uh, might end up, uh, say, here, and, you know, you cool them down, and slowly they find themselves here. But, you know, if you cool them sufficiently slow, and really, in order to make this into an exact scheme, you have to cool them almost infinitely slowly, so it's never going to be uh, an exact approach, but just a stochastic approach. Uh, but, you know, with some luck, uh, you'll find uh, that some of them uh, start condensing uh, in interesting minima, and then you choose basically your lowest minima possible. And this is actually a very sort of practical and um, uh, useful approach, and so it's sort of, you know, fairly widely used uh, in optimization problems. Uh. Okay, so this uh, sort of concludes uh, the sort of set of applications uh, of molecular dynamics. Uh. Now, I wanted to sort of hint uh, uh, at some of the advanced uh, uh, statistical mechanics techniques uh, that you'll actually see later in the class uh, uh, that, generally speaking, go under the umbrella name of green cubo techniques. Uh, and uh, sort of, you know, I'm taking uh, one of the simplest uh, examples uh, uh, in which actually Albert Einstein was, uh, was involved. So it's, a, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting uh, approach. Um, well, this is, this is to do on uh, uh, studying uh, uh, a macroscopic property that is really diffusion in a solid. Say so you could think at a silicon crystal and you are doping that silicon with gallium or phosphorus uh, and so you are interested in studying how the impurities uh, in this system uh, move around. Uh, and so if you want, uh, what you have is that you have a perturbation. You put a sort of gallium on the surface uh, of silicon and then this diffuses uh, into the solid. Uh, and sort of the general green cubo approach uh, is a formalism uh, that relates uh, uh, some of these uh, macroscopic properties, like a diffusion coefficient, a transport property, to microscopic properties. And you'll see that as, uh, as a sort of 
fluctuations of the equilibrium distribution. Okay, so you know, suppose that uh, that we are looking at the diffusion uh, of again something like gallium in silicon. What you would define as your sort of fundamental variable is the concentration of impurities. Uh, so that's a sort of four-dimensional function. Is a concentration function of the point in space you are interested, and function function of time. And then, obviously, there is sort of the diffusion law for, uh, for this uh, that says that basically the current uh, is really proportional to the gradient uh, of the concentration. And then uh, you put this together with a um, sort of continuity equation that tells you that the uh, derivative of the concentration with respect to time uh, plus the divergence of your current, that is your flux, uh, needs to be constant, uh, particular, let's say, it's going to be equal to zero. I mean, this is sort of very simply, says that if in an infinitesimal volume the concentration changes, uh, is that because there is a current uh, going out of that infinitesimal volume, and so the divergence of the current uh, measures, uh, measures, uh, measures this. Uh, and, uh, and with fixed diffusion law, we can put the two and two together, and basically obtain uh, this sort of relation, this differential equation for the concentration profile in time. Okay, so this is, if you want, uh, is our starting uh, uh, macroscopic uh, relationship. Uh, and then sort of, you know, what becomes interesting uh, is the derivation uh, that sort of Einstein did uh, in order to recover sort of the mm, connection with the microscopic uh, dynamics. Uh, and this is just a little bit of algebra of which I sort of will go over fairly quickly. Um, but basically what we are doing here, we are actually multiplying uh, the left term and the right hand terms uh, by R square and integrating it uh, over uh, overall space. Uh. And um, once we do that, uh, well, what we have uh, is that uh, on the right hand side, uh, this requires uh, sort of some calculus, uh, so I won't go really into the derivation, uh, but by sort of integration by parts, uh, you can actually show that this integral, uh, provided, say, the concentration is normalized to 1 when integrated in all space, uh, what you really obtain uh, is just 2 times the dimensionality of your problem. That is, if you are in one dimension, sort of small d is going to be equal to 1. If you are in two dimensions, it's going to be equal to 2, 2, 3, and so on and so forth. Uh, so this integral really just gives us the dimension of the space. Uh, and again, you know, we won't go into how we prove this. Uh, um, what we have uh, on the uh, left-hand side, uh, on the contrary, is really, you see, the average value of R square. Uh, what we mean uh, by this uh, bracket, uh, you see, is the integral over all space uh, of R square with sort of, you know, the probability, if you want the concentration, is identical to the probability of having a certain particle in a certain position at a certain time. So what this uh, integral means uh, is really the average value over all space uh, of R square, how much uh, your particles has moved, uh, and we have the derivative under time. And so you see, we start seeing somehow a connection between uh, a diffusion coefficient, uh, that's the macroscopic property, and the microscopic property, the dynamics, uh, that is, uh, how much the particles uh, are moving uh, once you put them uh, somewhere. Let me actually sort of give you an example of sort of, you know, what would this quantity look like uh, and how we would calculate it uh, in a molecular dynamic simulation. Again, you can think at your gallium atoms uh, being at the surface at the beginning, you put everything in motion and they are going to move uh, with, you know, a sort of random walk uh, towards uh, the inside. And if you want to calculate uh, this sort of average value of the mi what is called the mean square displacement, the average value of R square, well, you need really to do the average uh, over uh, all your particle at a certain time uh, of delta R square. Delta R square is really how far all these particles have moved. Uh. And you know, this would look uh, something like this uh, in a typical, say, solid. Uh. Actually, the example that I have here 
is slightly more exotic, but it was a sort of good example to show you the difference between a liquid and a solid. And is the case of uh, silver iodide, uh, that is in particular an ionic crystal in which uh, the blue iodine atoms uh, sit uh, on a BCC lattice. Uh, and for each iodine, uh, there is a silver atom, uh, but above, say, 420 Kelvin, this system is in a very peculiar state of matter, what is called a superionic state, uh, in which these iodine atoms uh, oscillate around their equilibrium position exactly as atoms do in a solid, uh, while the silver atoms uh, sort of move around uh, exactly like uh, a liquid. Uh, so it's a system that is really solid, it's crystalline, but one sublattice, the silver sublattice, uh, is sort of moving around as a liquid. And so if you calculate what are the average mean square displacements, that is, if you average on, say, all the iodine atoms, uh, what is their average uh, delta R square, how much they move uh, around, uh, well, you'll discover that really, you know, since that they are as crystalline solid, uh, they are just going to oscillate uh, around their equilibrium position. And so you, if you calculate that average uh, during a molecular dynamic simulation, you see there is a sort of, you know, first uh, very short uh, period of thermalization. The atom starts moving, but then they are just oscillating around. They are not going anywhere. So their instantaneous mean square displacement uh, has a value that is just a constant. Uh, so this is sort of typical of a crystalline solid. If you do the same thing uh, for the silvers, uh, you see that as a function of increasing temperature, you see at 250 Kelvin, below the superionic transition, also the silvers are sort of, you know, look more or less flatter, but when you increase the temperature, their mean square displacement uh, starts becoming a linear function of time. So the silvers are really moving around. They are diffusing away as a liquid. Uh, and so in the sort of, you know, mean square displacement, uh, you can see the signature of a liquid uh, when they sort of increase uh, uh, linearly with time. Uh, or you can see the signature of a solid uh, where they just are not going anywhere. They just vibrate uh, around uh, their um, equilibrium position. And so this is the quantity that, uh, you know, we could calculate in our molecular dynamic simulation, the average uh, of the mean square displacement. Uh, I written it here. Remember that it's going to be equal to 2 the times the diffusion coefficient uh, times the dimensionality of your system. And now we sort of, you know, um, work a little bit with this. Um, and in particular, uh, sort of, you know, we introduce this sort of alternative definition of the displacement of an atom. This is actually very useful. Uh, if you are sort of working uh, in periodic boundary conditions, uh, uh, you need to be careful. Often your um, molecular dynamics codes, uh, for simplicity, always uh, sort of show you the coordinates of the ions uh, as they were sitting in your first unit cell. So if an atom is diffusing as a liquid uh, and it sort of moves around and from one unit cell moves in the second unit cell, your code usually will actually sort of bring it back uh, by a lattice translation in the first unit cell. So a universal way to sort of take uh, into account uh, uh, what the actual position of an atom is, uh, is actually write uh, the uh, position that is usually a vector that satisfies this periodic boundary condition as an integral of the velocity. So in that sense, uh, the position of your uh, particle is always taking correctly into account uh, all the distance that has been uh, traversed. So if you have a unit cell, uh, really, and your particle is moving, uh, you'll uh, sort of, you know, integrate correctly your trajectory by doing the integral of the velocity while uh, sort of, you know, your algorithm would actually bring back uh, the particle once uh, it crosses a boundary. Okay, nothing deep here. We are just sort of writing the position as the integral of the velocity. But sort of with this definition, we can actually go back uh, and look at what is the expression for the average uh, of the mean square displacement, uh, that is the delta x square. And now we write it actually as the square as the, of the integral of the velocity at the instant uh, t. And so I'm just sort of writing this integral out uh, explicitly when I sort of, you know, expand uh, the square 
have an integral in TNT prime. And again, the bracket uh, means just uh, the ensemble average on all your particles, so it commutes with the integral. And so what we are calculating here is uh, really the sum over all the particles uh, and averaging that, that is dividing by the number of the total number of particles uh, of uh, the velocity at a certain mm -hmm. instant t prime uh, times the velocity of a certain instant uh, t2 prime. And uh, you know, we can actually, for computational convenience, uh, this is really an integral on a square, integral from 0 to t in one dimension and integral from 0 to t in the other dimension. But this expression is symmetric. Uh, so we can actually integrate this uh, only on half the square. We are integrating it only on the triangle. If sort of this were t and t prime, uh, and are a sort of integration interval in this, uh, we can just sort of, for simplicity, integrate uh, into half of this. OK. Uh, so what we have achieved here is uh, we have written this average uh, mean square displacement uh, as an integral of the average product uh, between the velocity at a certain instant uh, and the velocity at a different instant. Uh, and this is sort of you know, where our connection with the equilibrium properties is starting to emerge. And you'll see this in a moment. Uh, this, is, this is called a velocity autocorrelation function. And I'm writing it uh, sort of more explicitly. Uh, all of this has been done again sort of to keep the algebra simple in two dimensions. So, so remember the Einstein relation. We are in sorry, we are in one dimension. So uh, remember the Einstein di uh, relation. The small d, the dimensionality of your system is one. So we have the two times the diffusion coefficient uh, is equal to the derivative uh, of the mean square displacement. Uh, and the mean square displacement uh, in itself uh, has been uh, written uh, as the double integral. But when you take the derivative with respect to t, one of the integral cancels, uh, cancels out. Uh, so if you want, uh, this is our final relation. Uh, let me actually sort of write it, uh, write, it, uh, write it over here and sort of remove the factor of 2. We have that the diffusion coefficient uh, is written as this integral. We can sort of exploit uh, translational invariance in time. Really, if we are looking uh, at what is the average value of the product uh, of the velocity at a certain instant t prime times the velocity at an, uh, another instant uh, t2 prime, uh, well, that average product uh, is not going to be different uh, if we translate it in time. So we can sort of refer it uh, to an arbitrary origin. And so we just do a translation in which we shift uh, t two prime into 0, and so on. So this is sort of our uh, final expression. And this is what is called a uh, uh, velocity-velocity autocorrelation function. So you see, what we have uh, is that uh, the macroscopic property, the diffusion coefficient, uh, that is really telling you how a system responds to a perturbation. You put some gallium on your surface of silicon, and then there is this uh, macroscopic diffusion transport process uh, that is there is a perturbation and the system evolves, uh, can actually be related uh, to an equilibrium property of the system that is really ultimately what are the mean square displacements, how atoms microscopically move around. Uh, and in particular, uh, sort of, you know, the quantity that is sort of playing here is this velocity-velocity autocorrelation. You see, what this is, uh, what this is looking at uh, is, uh, suppose that you have a velocity at a certain instant, uh, and then you look at that instant uh, that is sort of tau away in time from sort of your instant zero. And you look at the product uh, of these two velocities. Now, if tau is very small, uh, the velocity is not going to have changed uh, very much. So in the sort of you know, limit of small tau, your velocity at 0 and your velocity at tau are going to be very similar. So if you want, there is a lot of correlation. When you take this product, uh, it's going to look a lot uh, like uh, v0 squared. Uh, and then all these things are normalized properly. So you know, it could look like uh, 1. But as you sort of move away in time, you go towards 
longer and longer times, uh, there is going to be no correlation. Your velocity at zero and your velocity at an instant that is very far away in time uh, is not going to be correlated. And so the product of this uh, can be, if you want, any number. And when you take the average, uh, you see the sort of ensemble average, the bracket, when you average this quantity on all your particles in the system, uh, this is just going to be zero because this thing uh, can have any positive or negative value because there is no correlation between the velocity at a large tau, and so this thing uh, is going to be zero. Okay? So the limit uh, of this velocity-velocity autocorrelation for very large tau is going to be equal to zero. The limit uh, for sort of very small tau is going to be equal to one or whatever your normalization factor is. Uh, and then there could be some interesting structure at a certain time. Uh, and sort of we'll see it in a moment. Uh, but suppose your system is actually sort of oscillating. Uh, it's, you're looking not at the liquid part of your silver iodide, but you're looking just at the sort of crystalline iodines, uh, sort of oscillating around. Uh, well, suppose that your iodine atom as a certain period of oscillation, so it sort of keeps going back and forth, huh? well, then there will be a lot of correlation huh? if you look at your velocity at a time zero and your velocity at an instant huh, that is roughly equal to a period of oscillation. Because if this thing were to oscillate exactly around its equilibrium, huh, every sort of period, huh, you would have that the velocity has become the same. Okay? So you will see a very definite structure in this uh, correlation function. If your system is not a crystal, if your system is you know, sort of diffusing away as a liquid, uh, as your time increases, the correlation uh, becomes zero. And even if it's a crystal, but it's not really you know, oscillating perfectly like a harmonic, uh, harmonic oscillator around that period, when you really go to very, very long time away, you start losing uh, this correlation uh, that sort of takes place uh, at every bit, uh, and that average quantity starts in itself to be zero. So how does a sort of, you know, velocity-velocity autocorrelation function looks like? Uh? Well, it looks like something like this. I need to sort of graph it here. <coughs> so again, when you're really sort of far away in time, uh, so, you know, what we are plotting uh, is the ensemble average uh, of, you know, V d t times v, d zero, v of 0. So very, very far away in time, it's going to be 0. There is no correlation between the velocity of the atoms. At sort of, you know, very, very small times, uh, there is really maximum correlation. And then sort of, you know, what is in between really depends on the dynamics of the system. Uh, and it can sort of look uh, very different uh, in different systems. Uh, but Einstein relation and the green Kubo formula that you have seen before actually relates, uh, first of all, the integral from zero to infinity of this function to the diffusion coefficient. So again, this function really represents uh, what are your microscopic uh, fluctuation at equilibrium, sort of how the velocities are correlated, so how your atom vibrate around. Uh, but all the sort of algebra that you have seen before shows also that the integral of this quantity gives you the diffusion coefficient in the problem. And that's one way of calculating the diffusion coefficient. The other way, if you go back to your slides, would be just calculating the derivative uh, with respect to time of the mean square displacements. Uh, and so in a liquid, uh, you have seen that your mean square displacements uh, sort of become linear if you sort of wait enough time with respect to time. And so the diffusion coefficient is also equivalently given by the slope of this system. Um, one of the interesting things uh, that you obtain uh, from the sort of velocity autocorre velocity velocity autocorrelation function that you don't obtain uh, from you know, the slope of your mean square displacement is that you can obtain uh, what we call the power spectrum. That is, you can look uh, at a system like a liquid uh, and figure out uh, what are the typical vibrations uh, in your system. Again, this is because uh, what, uh, you know, what we have said, if a system, if an atom uh, 
is oscillating around, say, an equilibrium position, there is going to be a lot of correlation. That is, if we look at time zero, and if you look after a period t, the velocities are again going to be very similar. If you look again at time 2t, they are again going to be similar. If you look at a time 3t, they are again going to be similar. So in the velocity, velocity autocorrelation function, actually you will see not only a peak at zero, but at peak at t, at 2t, and 3t, and so on, and they will sort of slowly decay. But so that means that the velocity, velocity autocorrelation function will sort of show somehow some periodic features uh, that are related uh, to what is the typical dynamics uh, of your particles. And so if you do the Fourier transform of that, uh, the Fourier transform of a function picks up uh, what are the relevant frequencies in that function. And so if you do that, uh, you actually find out uh, what is the vibrational density of states. So what are the typical frequencies of your system? And this is, you know, sort of an example that comes uh, from a molecular dynamic simulation of water. So what you have is you have, you know, your liquid water. Remember that, you know, sort of in a system like liquid water, you actually need only 30, 40, 50 molecules in a unit cell to basically simulate uh, the infinite system as long as you are sort of enough far away from the melting or freezing uh, transition. So you take the system, you let it evolve, uh, and then you calculate uh, at every instant in time t the product uh, of the velocity. You average that on all the molecules, and you have the velocity-velocity autocorrelation function. And that, uh, as a function of time, uh, will show typical beatings uh, that have to do with the frequencies in your system. You do the Fourier transform of this, uh, and you find a power spectrum. You find a vibrational spectrum of your liquid uh, in which you see you can identify a very large peak, a very sort of, you know, typical set of vibrations uh, that have really to do, this is actually heavy water, so it's got deuterium, that have to do with the stretching mode uh, of the deuterium oxygen distance uh, in the water molecule. So the modes uh, in which the two atoms vibrate uh, one against the other. So this would be sort of the optical intramolecular modes. And then you see another peak that has to do with the libration modes, the fact that the water molecule acts as scissors. And then you sort of find a lot of sort of, you know, lower energy modes. But again, just the Fourier transform of this velocity-velocity autocorrelation function gives you right away what is the vibrational density of states. And again, sort of, you know, a snapshot uh, of, you know, what are the important vibrations in your system. And a lot of spectroscopic properties uh, would be correlated with this vibrational density of states. Uh, because suppose that, you know, some of these states uh, are, uh, say, what we call infrared active. That is, when the atoms move around, uh, they create uh, a little polarization. They create a little local electric field. Uh, well, then those ma modes uh, would interact uh, and couple very strongly with sort of uh, electromagnetic radiation. And so depending on your frequency of you know, electromagnetic radiation, you would couple very strongly with you know, the appropriate frequencies uh, of your liquid system. And so this is, again, one of the sort of you know, very important quantities that you might want to extract uh, from a molecular dynamic simulation. Uh. And uh, if instead of having a liquid, uh, you had a solid, uh, again, that would be the sort of, you know, vibrational density of states uh, of your uh, phonon modes. Okay, this sort of concludes this parenthesis uh, on green cubo um, sort of approach. You'll see more of this uh, in sort of one of the later classes. But again, if there is one thing that you need to remember is this, uh, that this general sort of set of relation uh, make a connection <coughs> between a macroscopic property and in particular a response property of the system. The diffusion coefficient uh, is a response property of the system to a concentration in, homogene in homogeneity. And this macroscopic property, this response properties, can be connected uh, to equilibrium fluctuations, uh, something like the velocity-velocity autocorrelation function. And you know there are a lot of sort of interesting quantities that you can obtain from green Kubo relations besides the diffusion coefficient. Uh, so in particular, you could sort of you know, find out uh, the viscosity of your system. Suppose that you want to study liquid iron because you want to understand how seismic waves uh, 
propagate in the sort of liquid inner core of Earth, uh, well, you are very interested in the viscosity of the system because you want to know how sort of shear propagation takes place. Uh, and you know, just from the fluctuations uh, in the stress tensor, if you have your unit cell with all the iron liquid atoms moving around, the fluctuations uh, instantaneous due to the thermal motion in the stress tensor for that system give you the shear viscosity. Or say you want to study uh, how, say, one of the systems like water would couple and what would be its infrared absorption, well, you can actually look uh, at the instantaneous fluctuations uh, in the total polarization in a system, which is, you know, what is the microscopic local electric field there and how it couples. So, so again, you can sort of, you know, find the macroscopic properties uh, from a microscopic fluctuation or sort of electrical or thermal conductivities, again, sort of macroscopic transport properties can be found out from fluctuations uh, in the autocorrelation functions uh, for the sort of electrical charge or uh, uh, thermal carriers uh, in your systems. Okay, uh, this basically concludes uh, the classical molecular dynamics part. Uh, and what I wanted to show you next uh, is how we actually do first principle molecular dynamics. That is, how we sort of evolve atoms in times, uh, not using a classic force field, uh, but using sort of, you know, our favorite electronic structure methods uh, that actually for most of this class has been density functional theory, but doesn't really have to be density functional theory. Any of your electronic structure methods would, would work. Uh, uh, density functional theory tends to be the simplest and most efficient uh, to implement. Uh, sadly, in order to do this, uh, I need to give you some other reminders uh, of uh, sort of, you know, formal classical mechanics, uh, because uh, especially in first principle molecular dynamics, uh, we use a lot of the concept uh, of uh, extended Lagrangian and extended Hamiltonians. That is, we'll derive uh, the equation of motion from an appropriate functional that includes uh, sometimes uh, very exotic degrees of freedom. Uh. So let me actually sort of, you know, remind you, probably you have seen this in some of your physics or mechanics class, uh, but sort of, you know, let me show you how in general one can think uh, at, you know, evolution in phase space uh, and sort of find out the equations that integrate uh, the trajectory. And, you know, up to now we have really just seen Newton equation of motion, force is equal to the mass times acceleration. But there is a sort of more complex and, if you want, more elegant uh, formalism uh, to derive uh, the equation of motion for a system. And in particular, what I'm showing here is sort of, you know, what is called Lagrangian dynamics that in practice is actually very, very simple. And the way Lagrangian dynamics works uh, is this. Uh, first of all, uh, you have to construct uh, your Lagrangian, that is the functional that drives the evolution of your systems. Uh, and sort of there are various ways uh, in which one constructs these, uh, these functionals, uh, and there are even sort of equivalent ways. You, you one can construct different Lagrangians that give you sort of the same equation of motion or the same trajectories. But say what is important here is sort of, you know, the standard way. That is, the way we construct this functional is not very different from thermodynamics. We just take the kinetic energy of the system, T, we subtract the potential energy of the system, uh, and this is sort of our Lagrangian, T minus V. In general, uh, this, you know, the potential energy, as you have seen it, uh, tends to be a function uh, of position only. So usually we are written as a function of, you know, if we have n particles, R1 to Rn. So, you know, this is what is called a conservative field. Uh, if you are sort of, you know, a particle living in a gravitation field, uh, well, you are going to be in a certain position you're going to feel a certain potential or you're going to feel a certain force that's the gradient of that potential. You go somewhere else, you feel a different potential, you see a different force, and the work that you sort of make in going from one place to the other is just the integral of that force and it's independent of the trajectory. So this is sort of, you know, a very general sort of potential function that you have seen. And, you know, again, the kinetic energy, you have seen it and tends to be a function of the square of the velocities, uh, okay? So again, if you have only one particle, uh, 
uh, its kinetic energy is going to be one half times the mass times the square velocity. Uh, we usually, in the Lagrangian formulation, don't use the sort of uh, notation for the positions R1, Rn, but instead say in particular we use here the notation in which the coordinates are given by Q1, Q2, Qn, and then the velocities, we just indicate them as Q dot. And the reason we call them Q is that uh, what you sometimes want to do is not use uh, your regular coordinates uh, as the description of your you know, position for your dynamical system, but you might want to use uh, generalized coordinates. Let's say, if you study you know, water molecules, uh, and all of a sudden you want to describe uh, this liquid of water molecules uh, as rigid molecules, uh, so you want to say that you know, the angle between uh, the hydrogen, oxygen, and the hydrogen doesn't change. And if you want to say that you know, the distance between the hydrogen and the oxygen doesn't change, uh, well, then you want to sort of develop a dynamics uh, in which what you really move around uh, are not the position of the atoms, but you move around the center of mass uh, of your water molecules, uh, and you move around uh, their orientation. This is actually very important. If you remember, in sort of last class, uh, I've told you that when we study water, uh, actually, because water at regular temperature is still a quantum system, is still a system that has most of its vibrational states uh, frozen in their sort of zero point motion quantum state, uh, you actually tend to describe better liquid water if you describe it uh, as a set of rigid molecules uh, moving around. This is again you know, an approximation, but is actually a better approximation of the true dynamics of the system than an approximation in which you let also the internal degrees of freedom change. So suppose you want to sort of simulate rigid water around, uh, you need to find out what are the equation of motion for this generalized uh, set of coordinates uh, in which what you really move around when you move water is the center of mass and their orientation. Uh, and you know, it would be very difficult to do sort of using Newton's equation of motion with a constraint. Uh, and so what you do, you use really a Lagrangian formulation in a generalized formalism of generalized coordinates q and generalized velocity q dot. So what Lagrangian dynamics tell us uh, is that we construct our Lagrangian function t minus v, and then the equation of motion are given by these. And these are the Lagrange equation. We won't derive them, but sort of this is uh, how they are written. The derivative with respect to time of the partial derivatives of the Lagrangian with respect to the generalized velocity q dot minus the partial derivatives of the Lagrangian with respect to the generalized coordinates needs to be equal to 0. And you know, sort of this also focuses us on just uh, constructing uh, the two stellar function, kinetic energy and um, potential energy, for a system. And then it's just you know, straightforward algebra to derive this equation. And I've actually done the derivation for the sort of simple case uh, of Newtonian dynamics, uh, in which you see sort of, you know, how trivially the Lagrange equation that is written here turns into Newton equation of motion when you plug in for your Lagrangian one half mv square minus your potential energy. And you see, when you take the partial derivatives of the Lagrangian with respect to the generalized velocity, since it is a partial derivative, you only need to take the derivative of the kinetic energy with respect to the velocity, with respect to x dot, and then you need to take the partial derivatives uh, with respect to the position, and there is no position in the kinetic energy function, uh, so there is only the position in the potential energy. So what you see is that from the left uh, and the term, uh, you have the derivative with respect to time uh, of uh, mass uh, times velocity, and so that's nothing else than mass times acceleration. And then on the right, uh, um, right uh, hand term, uh, you have minus uh, the gradient uh, of your uh, conservative potential field. Uh, and so this is nothing else than the force. So we have first force uh, equal to mass time acceleration. And we have recovered uh, just by applying uh, Lagrange equations uh, to the Lagrangian of sort of you know, classical dynamics, uh, kinetics minus potential, we have derived uh, Newton equation of motion. So this is sort of one way
of uh, deriving equation of motion that again are going to be second order differential equation with respect to time uh, because if you think uh, you are taking uh, the derivative of a kinetic energy with respect to q dot uh, there is a second formulation of classical mechanics and I also need to sort of present this here that is called the Hamiltonian formulation and uh, it's sort of uh, again, very easy to see this if you think at a thermodynamic analogy. Say, when you're sort of, you know, looking at thermodynamics, uh, suppose that you are in the microcanonical ensemble, your thermodynamical functional is the energy. And so when you sort of, you know, look uh, at that uh, uh, sort of thermodynamical ensemble, it means that, say, you're looking at a system that has a constant energy, constant number of particles, and constant volume. But, you know, many times uh, it becomes uh, appropriate uh, to look uh, at actually sort of a system that lives at constant pressure or constant temperature. And so you transform your thermodynamical functional from the energy to one, say, of the Helmholtz or Gibbs free energies. You do E minus Ts uh, to obtain a thermodynamic functional that depends on temperature instead of depending on entropy. Or you do E plus PV to obtain the enthalpy that sort of depends on pressure and not on volume. And this is, you know, this general concept uh, of Legendre transformation. If you have a function, uh, let's say for the Lagrangian, was a functional of Q and Q dot, uh, you can construct uh, a new one uh, that doesn't depend, say, on Q dot, uh, but depends only on a new variable that we call it the conjugate variable to Q dot. Uh. So pressure and volume, temperature and entropy, chemical potential and number of particles are all conjugate variables. Huh? And so, say, if you take uh, the Lagrangian and you derive it with respect to Q dot, remember the Lagrangian is a function of Q dot, uh, what you obtain uh, is a conjugate variable that we call a conjugate uh, momentum. And then if you do this operation, this Legendre transform, uh, in which uh, you take, you know, the sign uh, doesn't really matter. In this case, you take a minus sign and you sum the product uh, of the conjugate variable times your original variable. You get a new function that doesn't depend uh, on your original Q dot variable, but depends only on its conjugate variable P. That's how you remove the dependence, say, on the volume and you put in the dependence on the pressure, making the Lagrange transformation in which you add PV, or that's how you sort of move from entropy to temperature in the Helmholtz, uh, Helmholtz free energy. And this is just very simple to do when you take sort of the differential of this, uh, of this quantity, because you're going to see that really because of this relation, you remove uh, all the dependence in Q dot uh, and you put in into your system a new dependence on P. Well, why do we do this? Uh, well, because again, with some algebra, we can find for this uh, new sort of function that is now called uh, the Hamiltonian, another alternative sets of equation of motions. Uh, remember, for, from the Lagrangian, we had obtained equation of motion basically for Q dot and Q. And from the Hamiltonian formulation, uh, if we work this out, uh, we obtain equation of motion uh, for Q and for P. And sort of the slight difference uh, is that instead of having basically a sort of dif second order differential equation from the Lagrangian formulation, now we have uh, double a set of differential equations that are only first order. So depending on sort of your problem, they can actually be easier to solve. They can actually be different, but they could lead to the same trajectories. So again, all this formalism of Lagrangian and Hamiltonian is just a sort of, you know, very general way to construct functions, either the Lagrangian T minus V or the Hamiltonian via the Legendre transform that give us equation of motion in Q and Q dot for the case of the Lagrangian and in Q and P for the case of the Hamiltonian. And if you actually work this out for the sort of standard case of Newtonian dynamics, you find out uh, that your Hamiltonian uh, is again something very trivial, uh, is that the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. So at the end of all of this, uh, for all the cases of interest to you, you see that either you construct a Lagrangian 
t minus b, and you have the Lagrangian equation of motion, or you construct uh, your Hamiltonian t plus v, and you have the sort of Hamiltonian equation of motion that I written here. And uh, one of the reasons that we do this, uh, uh, so this is, is that often uh, we want actually to simulate uh, the microscopic dynamics uh, not in the microcanonical ensemble, but in different thermodynamical ensembles, uh, say, in which we control the temperature, or we control the pressure, or maybe we control the number of particles, or maybe we control the chemical potential. And so we need to have uh, some of this uh, sort of formalism uh, to do this effectively. In particular, remember, when we have discussed uh, the sort of control of temperature, I've told you that there are sort of three different approaches in which you can do a canonical simulation, in which you can control the temperature in your system. And you could have a Langevin dynamics. You could have a stochastic approach uh, in which you randomly kick atoms uh, in order to accelerate them or to slow them down, uh, so that in analogy with a thermal bath, uh, they sort of, you know, on average, uh, have the right kinetic target kinetic energy for, uh, for your problem. Or you could do something that is probably even more brutal, although it tends to be very efficient uh, in thermalizing effectively your system, you could actually do a dynamics uh, in which uh, every time you have got new position, you renormalize those new position by renormalizing the velocity of the particle so that the sum of the kinetic energy is actually a constant. Uh, so a constraint method uh, would actually keep, uh, strictly speaking, the temperature of your system sort of constant to your target value. That can be actually very effective uh, to thermalize your system, to bring it uh, really very close to your equilibrium distribution. Uh, but it does have some uh, counter effects. That is, if you actually look uh, at what is going to be your equilibrium distribution in positions is really going to sort of be a canonical distribution according to the Boltzmann canonical ensemble. But if you look at your distribution of velocity, it's only pseudo-canonical. So often people, especially those that do sort of, you know, very complex and long molecular dynamics, uh, use the sort of most elegant and most accurate approach uh, that is really coupling uh, your system uh, to an additional dynamical variable using an extended Lagrangian or an extended Hamiltonian. So, you know, we have written our sort of Lagrangian or Hamiltonian in terms of generalized coordinates. Uh, all of a sudden, you can add one more uh, generalized coordinate. So you can add, if you want, a pseudo particle in your system uh, with its own uh, sort of kinetic energy and with its own potential energy. And you can construct the kinetic energy, and in particular, you can construct the potential energy so that this additional dynamical system, this additional dynamical variable, interacts uh, with the other dynamical variables, uh, basically exchanging temperature with it uh, so that to bring uh, the sort of average temperature of the real classical particles uh, to the equilibrium distribution. And so this is actually how you would write uh, the extended Lagrangian uh, for the case of a uh, canonical simulation, something in which we want to keep uh, the temperature constant. Uh, and so you see that's where sort of, you know, the power of all this generalized system comes into play. And again, you sort of write uh, now your kinetic energy and note that there is this sort of S squared term that sort of, you know, couples the kinetic energy of your real particles uh, with the kinetic energy of this new sort of thermostat, as we call it. Uh, so we have kinetic energy minus uh, potential energy. And then this is the new particle. This is the new sort of extended coordinate uh, that is described by a generalized position S uh, and a generalized velocity S uh, dot. And so if you want, its kinetic energy is sort of written in a trivial way, one half uh, a generalized mass times the square velocity. And this is actually how Nose figured out uh, the potential energy should look like uh, for a system of n classical particles uh, that you want to keep at 
an inverse temperature beta. Remember, beta is just 1 over the Boltzmann constant times the temperature. And so it's a very exotic potential energy, and it's sort of, you know, the logarithm of this uh, generalized coordinate. And so if you use this Lagrangian, you can construct uh, the Lagrangian equation of motion. So you will have equation of motion for your 3n particles that will be very similar to your standard equation of motion, but will have in there also terms that contain s. And then you will have a sort of an equation of motion for your nose or nose hoover variable that is an equation of motion for s. And you let all this system evolve. And what will happen is that uh, the uh, kinetic energies uh, of your uh, um, classical particles will start uh, to sort of distribute themselves uh, according to a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution that is according to the canonical ensemble. And people have worked out uh, all the statistical mechanics uh, of your problem. And so you know, worked out that you know, in the appropriate coordinate, you would need to have a sort of you know, Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. This is in the moduli of your system. And really, if you do all of this and you sort of you know, take an average uh, from your molecular dynamic simulation, you really see that uh, both the position and the velocity of your classical particles uh, are uh, distributed uh, in the appropriate way. So it's very sort of useful to calculate, say, response property of the system. Uh, say, again, if you want to calculate a diffusion coefficient uh, from the velocity-velocity autocorrelation function, you really need to have your velocity distributed according to the appropriate thermodynamical ensemble. So it's sort of, you know, the, if you want, most accurate and careful way of doing the dynamics. Uh, Nozel Hoover, so it's probably the most common way of thermostating your problem. Uh, it's not the most robust. It's sort of, you know, it's the approach uh, that gives you uh, the sort of, you know, long time thermodynamical properties correctly, but it tends to be very poorly, say, for something for a system that is very harmonic. Okay. A system is very harmonic when its, its potential energy is really a quadratic function of its coordinate. So if you have, say, a single particle that sits in a parabolic well, what we call a harmonic oscillator, or sort of a standard pendulum, that is a perfect harmonic system. A solid at very, very low temperature is also very harmonic. Uh, if you want the potential energy of each particle, is just a quadratic function of the, in the displacement from its equilibrium position. And so what are the trajectories uh, in a harmonic oscillator? Well, they look something like this. Uh, if you look now, if you go back to a one-dimensional position and momentum representation, uh, well, you know, a pendulum uh, does really this over and over again. So the position, so this would be the trajectory moving in time. So the position sort of oscillates back and forth. And the momentum or the velocity oscillates back and forth. And they are in opposition of phase. When the elongation is maximum, your momentum is minimum, and so on. I actually sort of uh, made, an, I guess, an incorrect, uh, uh, an incorrect axis. Uh, but thanks to the power of the Cintiq tablet, uh, now, now this, uh, this, looks, uh, this looks much better. OK. Now, suppose that you are sort of you know, studying uh, a sort of, not a single oscillator, but you are studying a solid at very low temperature. What you know, your Nose Hoover thermostat uh, would give you is something that is very different uh, from the equilibrium distribution. So the sort of equilibrium canonical distribution is going to look something in which you know the, the sort of momenta and velocity of the particle are distributed because now there is a, obviously if we have a real solid a small amount of interaction so each atom each harmonic oscillator is going to be talking with its neighbors and so there is, they are not going to be all in phase and perpetually in phase, but they are going to sort of, you know, exchange energy between one and the other. And so, you know, sort of a large sort of harmonic solid, but, you know, at a slightly sort of different from zero temperature, 
will have a distribution of velocity and momentum that doesn't sit in a perfect circle, but is sort of distributed around. If you do this with a Nose-Hoover thermostat, sadly, there will be no exchange uh, of energy. There will be no thermalization between all different atoms. They are going to be doing perpetually their own thing uh, in synchrony. And so the Nose-Hoover thermostat uh, works uh, very poorly for systems. Uh, the, more armo the more harmonic your system is, uh, the poorer the equilibration that comes from the Nose thermostat uh, is. Uh, and so you have to pay a lot of attention to system at low temperature. And so the one of the usual solutions that people mention is, calling no is using Nose Hoover chains, uh, in which you actually have your dynamical system, you have your thermostat, uh, and then you have another thermostat that thermostating your thermostat, the thermostat your particle, and then you have a third thermostat, the thermostat, the second thermostat, and suddenly you have to do this. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, harmonic solids uh, are actually very important. Uh, so there is a reason why sort of, you know, a lot of effort has been put into this, uh, because in particular, and this is again something that we'll see in one of the last classes, uh, in order to calculate uh, the free energy of a system at finite temperature, Often you need to do an integration from zero temperature to the present temperature. And so you really need to start uh, from a harmonic solid that you need to describe correctly. And if you don't do that, and so if you don't use your proper thermostating techniques, uh, uh, this is not going to work out. Uh. And you know, there is really a lot of dark hearts in all of this. Uh, you really need to be careful. Because you know, sort of the temperature is a global quantity, but if you have, say, a system with 100 particles, uh, you can have a temperature of 300 Kelvin by having sort of, you know, all particles distributed along the same temperature, but you can have also the same temperature if part of your system is very cold and part of your system is very hot. And if you want uh, the thermostat uh, has this role of making sure that the energy flow goes around so that all parts of your system are really at equilibrium. And you know, this can be actually a trickier thing uh, than, uh, than sort of it, it actually seems. Um, obviously, all these dots and sense are phantom free into sort of frantic saving. OK, these are sort of you know, a summary of all the books uh, in which you can find a description of these concepts. Uh, uh, if you have to read one for this class, uh, the sort of free primer that Fourier Colesi has put on, uh, on his um, Website. I'm actually very proud of this because Furio has moved recently to this very small town in northern Italy that is sort of my hometown. But anyhow, this is, this is available and free. It's 30 or 40 pages. I posted it also on the Stellar website. Uh, and it gives you a very clean introduction to molecular dynamics. Uh. And then I think this is a field uh, in which there are, in particular, two exemplary books. Uh. So if you really want to do this for a living, uh, uh, there are a couple of books that are very, very good. Uh, the Allen and Hildesley book, that by now is very old, uh, it's sort of, you know, from really written at the beginning of the 80s, uh, uh, when you can imagine computer capabilities were very different. Uh, and uh, it's actually remarkable, you know, somehow, how the clarity that you develop uh, by dealing with systems that are, you know, very primitive from the computational point of view actually develops uh, your intellectual skills. So, so this is really very, very good. Uh, and equally good is a much more recent book uh, that's sort of is in its third edition from last year, the Franklin and Smith, uh, that also has uh, many more advanced uh, topics. Uh, but either of these uh, are uh, really sort of very, very good uh, reference. And now sort of, you know, in the last 20 minutes, uh, I'll give you really the flavor on how we do first principle molecular dynamics uh, that is really nothing else than a classical molecular dynamics uh, with a lot of uh, additional variables. So we use this concept of uh, extended Hamiltonians. Uh, and you know, this is somehow, it's by now a little bit old, but I had sort of, you know, once downloaded this. This is actually the sort of, you know, citations uh, of uh, sort of first principle molecular dynamics, ab initio molecular dynamics, or the citation of the first paper that developed this concept that goes under the name of the Carparinello Techniques that is from 1985. And you see we are sort of very pleased with this exponential explosion. That means that basically there is a lot of useless literature out there that you, you can look at. 
So in order to do first principle microdynamics, I need to give you a reminder of sort of your favorite topic, uh, that is the expansion in plane waves of the total energy of a system. And you know, sort of hopefully you still remind something about this, but if you have a crystal that's going to be defined by the three primitive uh, direct lattice vectors. Uh, so, you know, we could have an FCC crystal and they point to, you know, one half, one half, zero, zero, one half, zero, and sort of the third one. And then we can define the um, reciprocal space and a reciprocal lattice uh, uh, whose uh, three primitive vectors, these G vectors, uh, are just defined as the duals uh, of your direct lattice vectors. Uh, so the scalar product between the reciprocal and the direct lattice vectors is to be equal to 0 or 2 pi. Okay. So this is the definition. Once we have uh, these uh, reciprocal lattice vectors uh, that for simplicity I'll draw here as being a two-dimensional and square, what we have uh, is again, you know, sort of these points here represent uh, all possible integer combination of reciprocal lattice vectors uh, that for my problem at hand here uh, would be, say, this would be the UN zone, this would be the unit cell of the reciprocal lattice. And so all these G vectors uh, in blue, remember, are such that uh, the function, the complex function E to the I G times R, uh, where G is any of these vectors represented by one of these points, uh, this function in real space uh, is compatible with your periodic boundary condition. It's going to have either one oscillation inside your unit cell, two oscillations, three oscillations, ten oscillations, and you know, sort of, it's going to be, generally speaking, in three dimensions. And so if you remember, we expand our wave function into linear combination of these plane waves, because these plane waves are uh, all the possible, it's a complete set of functions that describe uh, orbitals that have the periodicity of the direct lattice. Okay, so what was our sort of quantum mechanical system? We'll keep it simple. We won't go into density functional theory. We'll just sort of, you know, think again at the operator. You see the Hamiltonian raises its head again. It's just going to be the quantum kinetic energy minus one half the Laplacian plus the potential energy. And with the caveat uh, that uh, we develop, uh, we expand uh, the periodic part of your wave function, what we call sort of, you know, via the block theorem, uh, the periodic, uh, sometimes I call it U, but sort of, you know, what is the sort of periodic component, uh, we expand it, uh, we write it uh, as a linear combination of plane waves uh, with appropriate coefficients. Uh. So if you want, uh, your quantum mechanical problem uh, is, yet again, nothing else than trying to find uh, these numbers. Once you have defined your basis set, uh, then you have written an expansion, and then uh, all your algebra and all your computational problem is finding out uh, what this coefficient uh, should be. And this tends to be a very good basis set uh, because it can be made more and more accurate uh, by including G vectors of larger and larger modulus that corresponds to plane waves of higher and higher resolution. Not only that, uh, but it's actually a very manageable basis set uh, to use uh, because it's very easy to take uh, first derivatives, second derivatives of a wave function or square moduli because, say, if we take a first derivative of psi with respect to r, the only thing that we have is that each term in g gets down from here a factor i times g. And the second derivative gives us a factor i g scalar product i g, that is minus g squared. Okay. So our quantum mechanical problem, uh, basis for our first principle molecular dynamics, uh, has really you know, nothing else to do than finding what is the ground state energy that not really in a density functional formalism, but in a sort of simplified formalism, I'll write out uh, just as a sum of the eigenvalues uh, of our single particle orbitals, that is just the sum of all the electrons of this expectation value. 
If you remember, in density functional theory, the energy is slightly different uh, because the Hamiltonian uh, in sort of that approach uh, has actually become self-consistent. Uh, the Hamiltonian depends on the charge density in itself, uh, and so there are some additional corrective terms. But you know, from the point of view of you know, our uh, sort of formal in here, it doesn't really matter that we include these additional terms. Uh. And so, you know, what is that, you know, we have to deal with here? Well, we have again a quantum kinetic energy term and a potential energy term. And so the quantum kinetic energy is going to be the sum of the kinetic energy of each orbital, I written it here. And you know, what I was saying before, is actually trivial to calculate the kinetic energy if you have a wave function that is expanded in plane waves, huh? because this is it. This is the expectation value, remember. It's the integral over your, all your Hilbert space, that is the integral in space, uh, of this. Uh, this is the bra, so this is the complex conjugate uh, of the plane waves e to the igr, so it's e to the minus igr, times uh, the action of this operator to the plane wave e to the ig prime r. And so, you know, this second derivative, so with respect to r, gives us an ig prime times ig prime, that is a minus g square, the minus sign cancels out, uh, and so we have one half g square times the integral with respect to space uh, of e to the minus ig r times e to the ig prime r. And actually, if g is equal to g prime, uh, that is just going to be one, uh, and so the integral, it's actually, I sort of skip all the normalization, so the integral is going to be one, you can work out the algebra if g is different from g prime, is going to be zero. So this expectation value of the kinetic energy operator between two plane waves uh, is just going to be one half g square between two identical plane waves and is going to be zero if the plane waves is, are different. Uh, this is you know, what we say when we say that the kinetic energy operator uh, in a matrix representation uh, in which uh, sort of, you know, the rows uh, and the columns uh, are uh, the different plane waves uh, is actually diagonal. That is, uh, if you calculate uh, this, so you would have, say, g here and g prime here, uh, all the terms in this matrix, function of g and g prime, are zero outside the diagonal, and the diagonal is uh, one half uh, g squared. So very trivial to do in plane waves. Uh, um, if we want to calculate the second term in the energy, we need to calculate uh, the potential energy. And the potential energy is going to be, again, sort of the sum <coughs> over all the sort of, you know, <coughs> single particle terms in the potential energy. And I'm doing the same thing here. I'm writing this expectation value between two plane waves. And so I have, same as before, the exponential of the complex conjugate minus IGR times V of R times E to the IG prime R. And if you look at this, uh, this is nothing else uh, than the definition uh, of the Fourier transform coefficient uh, of your potential energy with respect to the wave vector G minus G prime. So now this part, uh, the potential energy in a plane wave basis set uh, is not anymore uh, diagonal it's going to be sort of, you know, it's going to have off diagonal terms. That is, if you look uh, in the previous sort of, you know, matrix representation in G and G prime, uh, what we have along the diagonal is just the kinetic energy terms uh, T that are uh, one half G square, but we are going to have uh, a number of, uh, of diagonal terms and also on diagonal, diagonal terms uh, from the potential. Obviously, the more you go outside the diagonal, uh, the more g minus g prime uh, is going to be large. Uh, so the more you're going to look at high frequency components of your potential. And in general, you know, unless your potential is really ill-defined, uh, the high frequency components uh, are going to be smaller and smaller. So again, sort of the overall Hamiltonian matrix, kinetic plus potential in a plane wave basis, tends to be diagonally dominant. As you move farther and farther away, it tends to be smaller and smaller. So we have actually written all the terms, uh, 
and then we can take the sum over all these expectation value. And so we have here sort of, you know, our Leviathan, if you want, the total energy as a function of this coefficient of the plane waves. So we have the kinetic energy term and the potential energy term. And sort of, you know, the fundamental approach that we take in first principle calculation is not trying to diagonalize this Hamiltonian to find eigenvalues and eigenvectors, because that operation would scale as the cube as of the number of plane waves. And it gives us not only sort of, you know, the 10 or 20 lowest eigenvalues that are the occupied states, but say if we have a simple system like the silicon atom, Remember, you have sort of seen semiconductors in your lab too, where you know at the end what you need uh, is really the four lowest uh, eigenvalues and the four lowest eigenvectors. Uh, well, if you diagonalize this Hamiltonian and you have a you know, plane wave basis set with a thousand elements, you get all 1,000 eigenvalues and eigenvectors. We don't need that, it's too expensive. We need only four out of a thousand. Okay, so the approach that you know most or all electronic structure approaches take uh, is actually an approach uh, in which we find uh, what are these coefficient uh, of the relevant uh, occupied orbitals. You see here, the total energy is just a function of the occupied orbitals. So for silicon, we would sum only on the four lowest orbitals. Uh, and by minimizing uh, this quantity, we find uh, what are the coefficients. Uh, so the electronic structure problem, again, it's a minimum problem in which you have you know, an expression for the energy that in density functional theory is slightly more complex, but at the end depends only on the coefficients of your plane wave expansion and on the matrix elements of the potential between plane waves and of the kinetic energy between plane waves. You calculate these once for all, or in density functional theory at every step uh, because your potential being self-consistent changes at every time step. Uh, but sort of if you have this and you have this, uh, is nothing else than a problem of finding the minimum with respect to these variables. Uh, sadly, you have sort of you know thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of them. So it tends to be uh, you know a very expensive problem uh, of minimization of a nonlinear function that depends on basically zillions uh, of variables. Uh, so how do we do this? Uh, well, let's see. We use a molecular dynamics idea. That is, uh, we have an energy, a function you know, of thousands of variables. Uh, so we have a multidimensional space uh, with really thousands uh, of coordinates. Uh, and as a function of those thousands of coordinates, uh, these uh, C and G um, uh, variables, uh, what we have is a total energy surface. Uh, so our problem looks nothing else like this. Uh, we have a total energy that is this sort of hypersurface in black uh, that is a nonlinear functional of these things. Uh, uh, in density functional theory, for a standard LDA GGA calculation, this system tends to have only one minimum. If you're doing a spin polarized calculation, it will have different minima that corresponds to a sort of non magnetic solution or all the magnetic solution with different sort of values for the magnetization, or maybe you have anti ferromagnetic solution with a total magnetization of zero but different spins and so on and so forth. So this potential energy surface can start to develop uh, some of the complex minima that I was showing you when we were talking about simulated annealing. And that's why actually finding the ground state of magnetic system tend to become very quickly much more complex. In LDA or GGA, it has only one minimum. And we need to find that minimum as a function of these very many coordinates. Uh, and so we use uh, sort of, you know, molecular dynamics techniques uh, and molecular dynamic analogies. Uh, and you know, I'll do this in one dimension. Uh, but really, what we want to do is find uh, an equation of motion, something that evolves uh, our coefficients uh, Cg so that they move uh, 
towards the minimum of that potential energy surface. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, we have you know, nothing else to do than to calculate uh, the derivative of that black potential energy surface uh, with respect to each and every variable, with respect to each and every plane wave uh, coefficient. Uh, uh, again, sort of lots of algebra that I'm hitting in there, but actually, and very pleasantly, it's actually very simple, and we sort of, you know, write uh, this generalized force uh, that is the derivative uh, with the minus signs, the gradient uh, of the energy with respect to each and every coefficient, uh, and is, you know, by chance, uh, nothing else than the application of the Hamiltonian itself uh, to the wave function coefficient uh, by coefficient. Uh, and so it's actually sort of very easy to calculate. Uh, and then uh, once we have that, uh, well, so if we look at this problem in one dimension, uh, what we have is our black uh, potential energy surface, uh, and we need to find uh, the minimum. Uh, so this is the energy as a function of all these uh, coefficient of planar waves. And uh, we can choose uh, a random value for this coefficient, calculate the energy, and what we will have uh, is a value for this energy. And now what we want is really to evolve, uh, to move uh, the value of each and every coefficient uh, so that the total energy of our system reaches the minimum. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, we need uh, the gradient uh, that we have written in the previous, uh, in the previous expression, that is nothing else than minus the Hamiltonian applied uh, to the wave function. That is the force. And it's you know, a perfect uh, uh, sort of dynamical analogy. If you are somewhere and you know what is the force uh, that drives you downhill, uh, well, then you have molecular dynamics techniques uh, to get to the bottom of your potential energy surface. Uh, and this is particularly easy if, uh, as in LDA or GGA, your potential energy surface is only one minimum. And you know, there are actually sort of two different approaches uh, that you could use. Uh, um, you could use a sort of you know, standard molecular dynamics. Uh, so if you are here, you put yourself in motion, uh, and what you start doing uh, is going down. Uh, but in a pure conservative molecular dynamics, uh, you're going to overshoot your minimum, go back uh, and oscillate uh, perennially. So what you do, you actually put some friction uh, so that you sort of, you know, slowly sort of lose energy and you basically again condense down uh, to your sort of lowest, uh, lowest energy solution. And so a standard molecular dynamics uh, technique uh, applied on the coefficient of the plane waves uh, with a friction term added uh, is one approach uh, that brings uh, all these additional degrees of freedom of plane waves uh, down uh, to their ground state. This would be one approach. Uh, the other approach would be actually evolving your system in a way in which the velocity is uh, proportional to the force. And so again, you can think uh, that when you are at the minimum, your force is zero, and so your velocity is zero. And so if instead of accelerating your system proportionally to the force and putting a friction, that is something that will sort of, you know, oscillate and dump down to the minimum, you move uh, with a velocity that is proportional to your force, uh, is something that, again, it will sort of move you towards uh, the ground state. Uh, once you are here, your sort of driving force is going to be zero, so your velocity is going to be zero. So somehow it's a different approach that also brings you to the zero. And sort of the two approaches have a sort of, you know, um, um, sort of slightly different uh, performance uh, depending on, on the kind of system that you are doing. Uh, in this case, uh, in the sort of dynamical way, you need to make sure that your friction is good enough. Uh, that is, you don't use too much friction, so you sort of slow down and never reach the minimum, and you have to be sure that there is sort of enough friction so you don't oscillate forever. And that's one way. In this sort of approach, uh, you need to make sure that your sort of system, again, doesn't really sort of stop short uh, 
of getting to the minimum because the closer you get to the minimum, the closer your velocity is to zero. And so you tend sort of, you know, to just get very close, but not rightly there. And there are sort of, you know, advanced techniques uh, to deal uh, with both of these systems. Uh, and uh, with this, uh, I think I'll actually conclude, uh, conclude here, because I wanted to sort of tell you um, more about how we actually evolve uh, in time uh, this problem. When we start uh, moving the atoms, up to now we were sort of you know, thinking at just how to get uh, to the ground state solution, but then we have the additional problem uh, of sort of you know, having the atoms move so our potential starts changing in real time. Uh, and we need to sort of you know, follow in real time what happens to the solution. And again, there are sort of two general approaches that go under the name of sort of Born-Oppenheimer molecular dynamics uh, or uh, sort of Carparinello molecular dynamics. And I think we'll leave that at this stage for, a, for a, one of the next lectures. Uh, so let me just uh, sort of remind you that another of the terms uh, that you'll see for this kind of dynamics uh, in which the velocity drives the system towards, uh, uh, towards the minimum, uh, goes actually under the name of steepest descent uh, or conjugate gradient minimization. And that's again a sort of you know, technique that you see very often in minimization problem, while sort of this uh, is really a sort of molecular dynamic kind of simulated annealing problem. With this, I'll conclude, uh, we'll keep uh, some of the sort of uh, ab initio molecular dynamics techniques uh, for one of the last lectures when we actually sort of go back and look at case studies of this. Uh, and in the last transparencies, uh, in the last few graphs of your notes, uh, you have again uh, some uh, freely available uh, bibliography of uh, quantum molecular dynamics uh, um, uh, primers. Uh, in particular, the sort of primer of Dominique Marx on his website, uh, the, last, uh, the last note, uh, is something very completely and very well written. With this I conclude, um, have a very happy weekend and we'll see you on Tuesday in the lab in uh, 115.